Okay, with that, it is 10.01. We're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, yes, lovely. Thank you, everyone who's saying good morning in the chat. Good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Lily Corey. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work at the Center for Children and Youth Justice. And um, today you are participating in a training that we call Creating Safer and Warm Affirming Systems of Care for LGBTQ Youth. Um, I come at this work with you, with you all today as an actual uh, uh, advocate in the Pierce County court system, but also as um, a person who identifies as um, an LGBTQ person um, and uh, someone who grew up in the system, but also as a professional working in, in these systems. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Nicholas Oakley, to introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicholas Oakley. I use he, him pronouns, um, and I've been at the Center for Children and Youth Justice for seven years, overseeing our work on behalf of LGBTQ plus youth, as well as commercially sexually exploited children. Um, <clears throat> uh, prior to that, I was an attorney, so I represented uh, young people and families in child welfare proceedings. And I just wanted to let everyone know I am having really bad internet today, so I'm going to try to keep my camera on when I'm talking, but turn it off when I'm not, just to try to preserve um, what I can. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so the Center for Children and Youth Justice, if you haven't heard of us, we are a nonprofit located in Seattle, but we operate statewide and increasingly nationally uh, and really on a collaborative model. So we partner with uh, different systems and community-based organizations uh, to drive reforms. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an example of our work. Just keep it in there for reference. Um, I mentioned two of the programs that we do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Equality Project, this is what we call our work on behalf of the LGBTQ plus youth, started in uh, 2013, uh, so uh, eight years ago, with a re research report of listening to their voices. We went around the state and talked to young folks who had been in uh, foster care or juvenile justice, identified as LGBTQ plus, and, and asked them about their experiences, also talked to uh, systems professionals, uh, and surveyed them as well. Um, to us, the, the results were not surprising that there had been a history of um, mistreatment and marginalization and poor outcomes for LGBTQ plus youth, and, and it really demanded that we do something about it. And so uh, upon publishing this report, we went back out across the state and talked to professionals about developing a solution. And that solution is the protocol for safe and affirming care, which we can provide to you if you've well, not already, I can't recall really. Um, uh, and so a lot of this uh, training is based on this protocol and we really do encourage you to use it as a tool in your practice. Next slide, please. Uh, and so we've divided this uh, training into a series of lessons. And we always start uh, with lesson one, know your why. And the quote here is, if you wanna build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And so the takeaway for me is that even if we knew exactly how to build the safest and most affirming systems for LGBTQ plus youth, uh, it wouldn't really matter if we weren't invested in the purpose behind doing that. So it's really important to explore our purpose. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of the protocol is, uh, and we spent a considerable amount of time, so this process took a year of going across the state, talking to stakeholders and folks, and, and really spending about a good third of our time uh, on the purpose and asking, what is this about? Um, and it came down to that it's about the health, safety, well-being of all youth, um, but that because, you know, we can't protect the health, safety, and well-being of all youth unless and until we have a, uh, efforts to address the specific needs of LGBT. Youth. Why? Because they, again, are overrepresented in these systems, experience unique forms of trauma, um, and uh, right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we'd like uh, you to think for a, a moment about uh, your own purpose here. And so consider for two minutes, um, is it important to have a specific effort to support LGBT plus youth? If so, why? And what is one question you have, something you want to learn more about, so your purpose for coming here today. And then we really encourage you to share these uh, responses in the chat box. And so we'll just give you a couple minutes to reflect on this and hopefully share. And again, I just really want to emphasize what Nicholas said about sharing today. Um, we really want this to be a space of learning 
I think we've all been in Zoom meetings where we just kind of talk at you, but if there are specific things you all are working on in your practice that you need to dig into, we are here as a resource for you today. So please, please, please let us know. We don't believe that there are anything as such quote unquote as dumb questions. We want you to feel comfortable enough to ask those questions. And we want you to step into this space with us um, in learning. And we always get something out of this as well. Um, so please, please feel free to be um, as open as you want today with us. <clears throat> and if you prefer to ask a question through a private message to Lily or me, that's fine. And then we won't share your name. So we'll pose it anonymously if that's just more comfortable for you. Great. So it looks like um, Cindy says everyone has value and purpose. Um, Stefan says it's important because, or Stefan or Stephen, um, it's important because kids can be um, unutterably cruel to children with any differences. Yeah, that's true. Bullying is definitely a thing that our young people experience. So maybe we'll take a few more seconds. Anyone else has other shop thoughts to share? Oh, okay. So Christy um, posed this question in the chat. Um, I haven't yet had the opportunity to work with an L a child that identifies as LGBTQ yet. Are you supposed to ask the child? Um, thanks for that question, Christy. We'll get into some of that complication and we'll definitely address um, that as we go through. Um, I think that that's a complicated question, but we'll definitely address it. We also have a follow-up training in January. It's, it's a whole two-hour training about talking to young people about SOGI, and we offer these trainings online every quarter, and it's free, so feel free to attend that as well. Um, so Christine says, safety concerns are higher for these children. And then Todd says, in Washington in general, how are LGBTQ kids in foster care, I'm assuming foster, foster care treated. Um, and that's great. We'll, we'll also definitely be getting into that today as well. And we'll also be talking about safety concerns. Um, great. So um, at, we're gonna go ahead and keep going, but um, please feel free to continue to use the chat. I will be definitely monitoring as we're talking. Um, and then also like as, as I'm talking, especially please feel free to um, post your questions as we go, if you have any questions related to content. So again, I uh, just wanted to visualize again, this is our why here is it's really this intersection of these three things. And that's why we're here uh, to build safer and more firm systems for LGBTQ plus youth. Next slide, please. Uh, we also wanted to you know, share our vision and really it is that all professionals and caregivers really see the support of young people in the development of their sexual orientation and gender identity, which by the way, every single person has a gender identity. Every single person has a sexual orientation as critical to that use uh, and safety, health, and well-being. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also wanted to share some uh, recent data. So this is the Healthy Youth Survey the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, or OSBI, administers this uh, periodically. Um, there's a number of questions. Uh, there is an optional uh, questionnaire on gender identity and sexual orientation and, and other sexual activity. Uh, principals can opt in or opt out. Um, many did opt in and including in very rural, so this, rural areas of the state. So this is the 10th grade. We just wanted to pull this data just to highlight um, really that that LGBTQ plus young people are a part of our community across Washington state. Um, so you see on the left side, sexual orientation, 78% identifying as straight, 3%, uh, I don't know what this question is asking, so that's 81%, leaving 19%, which we can reasonably uh, uh, sort of generalize as identifying as LGBTQ plus. So uh, nearly one out of five, all young people identify as LGBTQ plus in this state. 10th grade. Gender identity, uh, you have 44% uh, identified as male, 50% identified as female, 1% as transgender, 2% as questioning, not sure. So, uh, and 1%, something else fits better. I know the type is, is somewhat small. 
Um, and so here, you know, reasonably one to four percent identifying as LGBTQ plus on the basis of their gender identity, at least. Um, so th those are big numbers. Uh, and then all the national research suggests that there's an even greater percentage within the child welfare system so that there's a disproportionate amount. So really, when we talk about this, this is talking about serving a substantial part of the population of, of, of young people in child welfare and foster care. Next slide, please. Uh, real quick, Nicholas, before we move on, I just also wanted to say that with the Healthy Youth Survey, they break it down by county as well. Um, so please, please, please um, go on to this website and really look at this data around um, sexual orientation and gender identity in your own community. Because what we often hear from a lot of our um, partners is, oh, there aren't LGBTQ people in our community. And that's absolutely not true. Um, and that we have data to, um, to prove that. Yeah, I'm also seeing a few things about an echo, and I really apologize for that. I'm not quite sure what to do at this point, but actually I'm going to turn it over to Lily. So hopefully my issue resolves for, for those of you who are getting it. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and I just I just also want to acknowledge uh, Jim's comment. Um, I don't know how to use personal pronouns a lesson, and that would be nice. We won't be going over that. We will be touching on that, but I will definitely make sure that you have a um, a website that that um, links it. It's called mypronouns.org. And I don't know if Nicholas or Ryan want to bring that up, but that one walks you through um, how to use personal pronouns um, in detail. And we won't be getting into that detail today, but I want to make sure that you have a resource. Um, so thank you so much for that, um, that larger question. So this is uh, lesson two, know your terms. Um, so this is when we're going to be getting into the nitty gritty, like the, the, um, the language, right, that surrounds this community, right? Um, and so this is lesson two, know your terms. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world, right? And so really today um, in this lesson especially is gonna be, and we're gonna be spending a lot of time in this lesson, is just to kind of get familiarized with the terminology and uh, kind of the language surrounding this community. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is this acronym SOGI, right? Sex and SOGI. So SOGI stands for sexual orientation, gender identity, expression. And we often throw that term around to, to kind of, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's an acronym, but, but basically we want to, it, it, it's how people's identities that then break down into different categories, right? And then these four categories. And we just really want to emphasize that everyone here participating today in this, in this Zoom, um, has a SOGI, everyone has them, right? And so again, that is the, the four categories are sex. And the first one is that it relates to the question that we're answering is what did a doctor mark on my birth certificate, right? And then that's related to anatomy, chromosomes and hormones. And we'll get a little bit into like why that can be a little bit problematic for the community, but that is basically the question that we're asking is what did a doctor mark on my birth certificate, right? Related to anatomy, chromosomes, and hormones. Gender identity. So this is separate from sex, okay? And this is how do I feel on the inside, right? And this is related to identity and sense of self, right? So this is, this is that internalized piece. The next one is gender expression, right? And this is different from gender identity, which is also different from sex right? These are all four very different things. And this is how do I present myself to and how am I presented or how am I perceived by others, right? So this is external communication and this communication of gender includes dress and appearance, right? And then sexual orientation. Again, this is all different. And this is answering the question, who am I attracted to? And this relates to romantic and erotic responses. And I'm seeing that there are some questions in the chat. So um, we're gonna go ahead and um, I just wanna acknowledge Gabrielle's question. How um, involved in fostering of these children is the LGBT community if little what is being done to reach out to community to encourage becoming foster parents slash homes? Um, Nicholas, I don't know if you want to go ahead and tackle that in the chat, but I think that we can directly address that um, in the chat. 
So going back to this again, this is these are four separate categories and each of the terminology that we'll get into kind of relates to these different categories. And the biggest thing that I want you to walk away with is understanding that these four things are very different and young people are going to be looking at you to know the difference between these, especially if you're working with LGBTQ plus young people. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get into terminology. We're gonna talk about how it all fits. But the biggest thing I want you to walk away with today is knowing that these four things are separate and different. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story, right? And this is a story that I think we're all familiar with, right? So sex assigned at birth, right? We're born. A doctor says you're either a male or a female. And as far as we know, gender X is not an option yet on a birth certificate at birth, right? From there, the way that we've understood society, right, is those, those males that were marked at birth grow up to be man and boy. And this relates to gender identity, this internalized sense of self. Those females grow up to be women and girl, right? These are, this is what society has told us is our story, right? Those male man boy grew up to be masculine, present as masculine. This is gender expression. Those female woman girl, they grow up to be feminine, present as feminine, right? Sexual orientation. Those male man masculine are attracted to women, right? Those female woman feminine people are attracted to men. And then this is again, related to sexual orientation. And this again, is kind of what society has told us is the narrative, right? And that those male, man, masculine, <laughs> attracted to women, men engage in sex with women, right? And those female women, feminine, attracted to men engage in sex with men. This is what we've been told is society. And the reason why we put this in is because in our work, we've noticed a lot of young people who um, are um, CSEC um, are also have an overlap with an LGBTQ plus identity. So we have to be really uh, attuned to um, their needs as well. Again, this is what we're told, right? <laughs> but the thing that we want to really offer is that there's a really different narrative. And while a lot of people fit into those two pillars that we saw, not everyone does, right? And the thing that we really want to emphasize is that with our LGBTQ plus young people, a lot of them don't fit into those pillars. So the thing that we want to offer you is what's called the SOGI spectrum, okay? And this is a resource developed by the, um, the Trans Student um, Education Resource Center. It's called the Gender Unicorn. And this kind of offers a different perspective. So instead of saying like, I am this or that, right? This, this resource is saying, to what degree am I female, woman, girl, male, man, boy, other genders, right? And so that's gender identity. And again, that's that internalized sense of self. Gender expression, to what degree am I feminine? To what degree am I masculine? To what degree am I something else, right? And that's that external gender expression, right? Sex assigned at birth, right? We have female, male, but we also have this other category as well, um, or what we call um, intersex young people. And these are, um, and we'll get into the definition of what that is in a later activity, but these are young people whose, they, they were given uh, an assignment um, and the reality of their anatomy is that that assignment is a little bit more complicated than the, than the female or male. And a really great resource for these young people is, um, uh, I believe it's interact, interact.org. And Nicholas, if you wanna go ahead and drop that resource as well, that'd be great. And then we really like this um, visual because it breaks down sexual orientation into two very distinct categories, which is important to our LGBTQ plus young people, right? So it, to what degree am I physically attracted to women, men, other genders, right? And then to what degree am I emotionally attracted to women, men, other genders? Noting that physical attraction and emotional attractive attraction are actually different 
And there's a whole set of terminology that our young people use to really distinguish that as well. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and stop for a second because I know that this is a lot, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and, and pause for any kind of questions, anything that we can clarify before we get into our next, um, our next uh, less, or part of the lesson, which is more terminology. Pausing. You, you are also welcome to come off of mute to ask your questions if you want as well. I have a question. Yeah, Jan, what's up? Well, I've got teenage grandchildren and one of them kind of expressed um, when she was 14 that she thought she might be bi. And I felt like you don't really need to claim anything at this point. You know, you just have to be a decent person. And I, I hoped I didn't give her a message that it didn't matter that we're discussing that, that you don't need to make a decision when you're 14. Is that appropriate or I, I just, I always kind of wondered about that when they're 14, 15, 16, 18, kind of going through this, you know, trying to figure out where they where they would fit. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you yeah, no, no, no. I appreciate that. I think that that's a really real uh, response that we all have, right? Um, and I think we also have to really look at and be guided by what research has said. And so research says actually that um, young people know their gender identity by the age of two. And a lot of young people actually um, really start to explore their sexual orientation um, as they hit puberty from the age of nine through puberty, right? And so something to also really emphasize as well is that what we see here is actually very fluid. It's actually very normal and developmentally healthy to have exploration and to have, you know, maybe, maybe I am um, bisexual in this phase of my life, but maybe I am you know, starting to realize I'm attracted to, to mul multiple genders. So maybe I'm going to actually say now that I'm pansexual. That does not mean that they're wishy-washy or that they're um, in a space where they're not being consistent, right? It's actually very healthy and developmentally normal to um, have that exploration and fluidity, right? Um, so, sorry, Jan, go ahead. You have your hand raised. I just want to acknowledge that. Jan, are you there? I forgot to the unmute, sorry. No, you're uh, Just to follow up on that, that I felt really um, happy or I was pleased that she felt like she could ask me and op open about that. And that talking with maybe the kiddos that we're working with that we don't know quite as well, that if they feel like you're, at, that you can talk with them about this subject when they're growing and learning themselves or wanting to express it. And that they're accepted. That's what I was I, all, all I wanted to say. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's really important. And I think for a lot of our young people who go through systems of care, this kind of stuff isn't emphasized and talked about. And actually, we will get into a little bit later about why that's a safety concern um, for us to not actually talk about these things with these young people. So thank you, Jan, for bringing that in. Um, and thank you. And I appreciate that um, you and your granddaughter have that relationship. I think that's really lovely. Um, okay, so if there aren't Will handouts such screenshots be available? Just lost power again. So using tiny screen on my phone. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Tamara, for that. Um, yes, we will be sending out the slides. You will have the slides as well as other handouts that, we, um, that we'll use today. Um, so now we're actually gonna go into breakout rooms. Um, I'm gonna drop something into the chat for you all. We're gonna play a little game. And, and by game, I mean, this is really a learning tool for all of us today. Um, and um, I'm gonna ask you all to open this file that I just put into the chat. I'm gonna break you into breakout rooms and you'll have about 10 minutes to walk through. This is the match game. So you have a word bank. <clears throat> you have a word bank at the top of your screen and there are definitions that are aligned. Your job is to match those words to those definitions. Do not cheat, do not use the Google. I wanna know what your instincts are. Um, and then from there, um, I'm also going to ask you if it relates to sex, um, gender identity, if it relates to gender expression, or if that word re relates to sexual orientation. Fun fact, I'll give you a hint. There are some words that relate to multiple of those categories, okay? 
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and put you into breakout rooms. Well, it's just randomly assigned. You'll have about five people, five to six people in each of your breakout rooms. So I'm going to go, are there, before I open the breakout rooms, are there any questions related to what we're doing today together? Okay, since there's silence, I'm going to go ahead and open the breakout rooms. You'll have, again, about 10 minutes. So I'm going to bring you back at um, 1036. Um, so good luck. Hi, Ryan. It looks like um, Nicholas's internet died. Here's my backup. Sorry about that. <clears throat> that must be why when I think it took his file with him so people couldn't download it. Oh, did it? So that's why I've been jumping in between the rooms just to get people, people are saying, we didn't have the file oh, if oh. they didn't download it ahead of time. So. Okay, Is does everyone have it? I think so, but I'll go ahead and put it in chat again too. We will be going over it. So that's not, that's not. I actually made a really quick PDF of it too because some of the people are from court aren't, like there's firewalls that block downloading attachments. So. That makes sense, okay. If you're gonna do it, make sure you share your screen with that file or that so that they can see it. Does that make sense? Oh, I have it in my PowerPoint. We're good then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do I have it? I have it in my PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. Give everyone a minute warning. Even when you hit close all rooms, it gives them another minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, give them, I'll give them that extra minute. I'll go ahead and close the rooms. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Apologies for some technical difficulties. I heard that we had that. Um, we definitely will be walking through this document together in this presentation. So no worries um, if you didn't get to fully do the activity, we are going to do it together. Um, we're just waiting for some rooms to come back. How is that for folks? That was challenging. Yeah, thanks for, yeah. The first time I did it, I was like, I'm part of this community. What do these words mean? <laughs> Adobe? I appreciate that. Okay, so click here and install, okay. How about other folks? How was that for folks? Uh, well, we didn't get through all of them, but um, yeah. we got to about number 10, I guess. Wow. That's wow. farther than we got. We're, we were all newbies still learning. Yes. We, we got about four. Or we guessed faster. There you go. And we only got to three. So we were really moving it slow. Half of us couldn't see the handout though. So we were oh, reading it. No, most yeah. of us didn't open the document. Okay, well, yep. Ryan has said that there's a PDF version and I will make sure that you all get a PDF version of it. Um, but I promise you, we are going to walk through it right now in this presentation. Um, so let's let's go ahead okay, and, and sign oh, on yeah. again. Yep. Okay. All right, folks, if we can go ahead and mute. Um, and then I just also, Christine says, I realize, um, I realize I need to better understand the terminology. Yep, don't we all? And I just also wanna say that it's always, always changing. 
Um, and thank you um, for the wasn't very thought provoking. I agree. Um, I definitely think that this community is a lot more nuanced than like terminology, but we always want to start with the foundation um, so that we have common language when we get into some of those more nuanced conversations that we're going to have today. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we do, we want to do this thing of we want to have this mix of, you know, have nuanced conversations, but also have very tangible resources that you all can use, right? Um, so that's what we're trying to accommodate to today. Um, but with that, we're going to go ahead and get into this. Um, so number one, describes a person who does not identify exclusively as a man or woman. This person may identify as being both a man and woman, uh, somewhere in between or falling completely outside of these categories. This term is non-binary or um, NB for short. You might've seen this abbreviation, NB, right? And this relates to gender identity. Um, and then number two, uh, an umbrella term that describes a person whose gender identity does not correspond with their sex assigned to them at birth. These folks are transgender. And this also relates to gender identity. Now, really important thing to understand, transgender is an umbrella term and non-binary falls under that umbrella term, but not all non-binary people are transgender, okay? That's very important to distinguish. And so if a person's non-binary, they might be like, I'm trans non-binary, or they might just be like, I'm just non-binary, right? Again, we don't have to know everything. We just need to respect their language and pair it back parrot it back to them, right? Um, the other thing to know about transgender is be aware of the ED, okay? So transgender exists in the present, right? Someone is trans, someone is transgender. Not transgendered, okay? Be very aware of that. That ED, that will immediately like that's like one of those like red flags that set off in young people's ears when they hear transgendered, okay? So transgender, okay? That's where we're at. Number three, describes a person who identifies as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gender neutral, questioning, and or many other identities. While this term has been used in a derogatory way in the past, many individuals and groups are reclaiming it as an all-encompassing way to describe those who do not identify as heterosexual and or cisgender. These folks are queer, okay? And I know that that, for some generations, it doesn't sound great, and that's real, but we also have to be real about what the young people are using, and this feels like a really inclusive way to say I'm in the community without saying exactly who they are, right? So it's, a safe, it's really a safe word. And this, again, is related to sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So you can be queer in any one of these in any one of these categories. Any questions about these three terms before we move on? Okay, moving right along. Um, this number four, the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one sex and or gender not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. This term is bisexual and it is sexual orientation, related to sexual orientation. Can you make the answer sheet available to us? Absolutely, you will be getting these slides and they have the answers in there. And then I also have a document that has all the answers in this as well. So um, this, term you might have seen is uh is is doesn't seem like the, uh, the way that we understand bisexuality and this is because a lot of advocates have said hey the way that you were describing bisexuality before really leaves out people who are gender non-conforming and non-binary people how can we make this definition more inclusive right because again non-binary is a gender identity and if they're bisexual that's a sexual orientation so you do have non-binary people who are bisexual, right? And, and we wanna make sure that that's inclusive, right? And so this is why this definition now exists for bisexuality. Thank you, bi bisexual advocates. Number five, an umbrella term for differences in sex traits or reproductive anatomy. 
describes people who are born with these differences or develop them in childhood. There are many possible differences in genitalia, hormones, internal anatomy, or chromosomes compared to the usual ways that human bodies develop. These folks are intersex, and this is related to sex, okay? And fun, fun statistical fact, there are about as many intersex people in the world as there are redheads. So some people know, some people go their whole life without knowing. It really depends on your body's anatomy and your body's, like, the way your body is, right? And it's, it's yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, dear. Where are we at? Okay. Number six. Describes a person who does not experience sexual attraction, but may experience emotional or romantic attraction. These folks are asexual, and this is related to sexual orientation. Okay. Oh, my. Why is my computer being like this? Okay, we're going to do this. Okay, number seven. A term sometimes used to describe indigenous North American individuals who have gender identity and or gender expression that does not traditionally align with their sex assigned at birth or have cultural identity distinct gender apart from man or woman. These folks are two spirit. This is related to gender identity and sexual orientation and or sexual orientation. Really important thing, okay? If you are not indigenous, you cannot be two-spirit. That is like the one caveat. It's very, very specific to indigenous folks in North America, okay? The other thing to know as well is that two-spirit in and of itself is an umbrella term. And for some of the young people you work with, there may be more culturally specific names that they align with other than two-spirit. The other thing to know too, is because we live in the reality of colonization, is that some tribes do not acknowledge two-spirit identities, right? Even though that they've existed in the past. So we have to also be aware of the complications that arise with colonization when working with this population. If we're working with a two-spirit young individual whose culture and identity does not accept them, right? Not all tribes do that. A lot of tribes I work with, really great about this, but we have to be aware that because each tribe in and of itself is their own sovereign nation, we have to be aware of the, the, the differences and we can't just lump them all into one place. So my advice to you is to really lean into the expertise of the young person you're working with when it comes to their culture and their understanding of their tribe, okay? Really parrot their language. And if there's a better word that fits in their own language, use that. If they want that, use that but two-spirit is that umbrella. And that's related to gender identity and or sexual orientation. Are there any questions about that? I know that that one's kind of complicated and I just spat a lot of language at you. I wanna slow down. Okay. Number eight, a broad term referring to individuals who do not behave in a way that conforms to traditional expectations of their gender whose gender, gender expression does not fit neatly into a category. This is gender non-conforming, and this is specifically related to gender expression. And the reason why we put this term in here is because it specifically relates to PREA, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which specifically uh, protects trans and gender non-conforming folks in prison systems, right? So this is based off of how you are perceived. Right, you could have a straight man who presents as feminine and Priya would still apply. It doesn't matter if they think they're LGBTQ or not, it's how they're perceived. So that's just something to, to know is that this specific term was created to protect those populations in prison systems. Uh, but it is used. It is used outside of population of uh, prison systems too. But it's just important when we're working with juvenile justice to know that. Number nine, an umbrella term that describes a person who identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and or queer questioning. In some cases, I for intersex, A for asexual, two for two spirit. It's actually two S now. 
um, for two spirit and or plus to reflect a broader sense of inclusivity is added. This is LGBTQ plus, right? And this is related to sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. Number 10, describes a person who does not identify with a single fixed gender of or relating to a person having or expressing a fluid or unfixed gender identity. This is gender fluid. And this again relates to gender identity. Number 11, describes a person whose gender identity corresponds with the sex assigned to them at birth. This is cisgender, right? So the opposite of trans is cis, right? If we're getting into Latin, we love Latin. So cisgender folks is like, like for example, for myself, when I was born on my birth certificate, they marked female. And I said, okay, internally, I feel like I am a woman. So my gender identity aligns with my birth certificate. Therefore, I am cisgender. And that again is related to gender identity. Uh, or cis for short, right? Um, 12 is an identity term for romantic and or sexual attraction to people regardless of gender identity or to people of all genders. For some people, gender is not a defining characteristic of attraction they feel to others. Other folks may feel gender is a significant part of their experience of attraction. These folks are pansexual, and this is related to sexual orientation. Are there any questions regarding this activity? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, so one of our kiddos, um, uh, he's soon to be 18 um, and identifies as a boy um, some of the time and, and was being moved to a group home. And then the group home um, said he couldn't stay because um, something about they didn't know where to put him in the girls' room or the boys' room because biologically a girl identifies as a boy. Um, so the boys' room made sense to me, um, but they said something about bathrooms or something. So I don't know how to advocate in that realm. I mean, I understand the whole bathroom thing, especially if, you know, showers, I don't know what, you know, I haven't seen to see, was it individual showers or, mm -hmm. so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for that. Actually, there are, um, thank you, Sarah, for that, because I think that this is something that gets really convoluted. I just wanna say that the law is actually on your side um, and on that young person side. Um, and we'll get into a whole thing about that. And I'd actually really love to use that, um, that case that you brought up um, to kind of explain some of the law stuff and like what I would do as that's our next lesson. So um, short answer uh, that I don't think we'd really be covering in the law piece um, is I, I really believe in the autonomy of young people. And so I would refer to the expertise of that young person and ask them what they want in that situation. Um, first and foremost, because I, it, it is it is a complicated situation. Um, and then I will get into kind of how the law is on your side uh, to support this young person. Um, are there any other questions related to terminology before we move on? Thanks, Tim. We try to be try to break it down. Any other questions? Okay. So lesson three is know the law, okay? If we desire respect for the law, we must first make the law respectable. And what we're gonna be covering is um, LGBTQ plus per protections and systems of care. So the anti-discrimination laws that we'll be going over is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which is PREA, We'll be going over the Washington, um, the revised code of Washington. We'll be going over some wax, and we'll also be covering DCYF policy um, 6900. And these are all 
protections for LGBTQ plus young people in these systems of care. So Priya mandates that uh, facilities respond to distinct needs of transgender and intersex inmates and residents um, in the following areas. So this is housing and programming placement. Decisions for transgender and intersex youth must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. So there isn't like a universal policy. I mean, Priya is a universal policy, but it is very specific to that individual. Um, inmates' view of their own safety must be given serious consideration. Again, it goes back to the autonomy of the individual. What do they perceive as their biggest threat? Um, and this is not related to your case, Sarah. You have actually, there's a different uh, set of laws that cover what you're talking about. But transgender and intersex inmates must be given an opportunity to shower separately. Uh, Cross-gender viewing and searches. No transgender or intersex inmate may, can be searched for the sole purpose of determining geni genital status. Again, your genitals does not equal your gender identity. Okay, I just wanna say that very bluntly, that that is not what that is. And this law kind of understands that. This information can be um, ascertained through conversations with, with the inmate or by reviewing medical records. Usually you have access to all of that stuff. There's no need to strip search people, especially in prison systems. Just don't do it. It's, it's, there's no dignity. Let's not do that. If necessary, an exam can be conducted by a medical professional. Yeah, uh, people who work in prison systems should not be stripping people. Oh, sorry, I'll go this way. Okay, so um, that is PREA, um, and that covers, again, prison systems. Uh, revised Code of Washington. So this is, so this is like, this covers, oh, sorry. So this covers everyone, right? So this is the Freedom from Discrimination De Declaration of Civil Rights. Um, which includes sex, sexual orientation, orientation, including gender identity. So you as a Washington state resident, person living in Washington, you have the right to not be discriminated on the basis of your sexual orientation, including your gender identity. That's a very important thing to understand is that you are, in terms of your like civil liberties here in Washington state, you're pretty, pretty well covered as an LGBTQ plus person. Okay, the right to the full enjoyment of any accommodations, advantages, facilities, or privileges of any place of public resort, accommodation, assemblage, or amusement. So if you're in public and you want to use the bathroom that aligns with your gender, do it. You're protected. Okay, that's very important. I, I know I used to work with young people, used to do case aid stuff, and some of the young people I used to work with, they used to be like, what bathroom can I use? And I was like, your choice, dealer's choice, whatever you want, right? And there's actually been a lot of, like if you have a young person who's like maybe not comfortable, um, I highly suggest seeking out single stalled units. There's, I mean, and it doesn't matter if it says man or female on there, if it's a single stalled unit, it doesn't matter, it's a toilet at the end of the day, right? So that that's what, that's what I would suggest if there's, um, if that young person feels uncomfortable. Washington Administrative Code. So this is actually gonna be really important to your point, Sarah, right? So this covers group care facilities and services. This covered child uh, placing agencies and adoption services. And this also covers licensing for foster homes. You must follow all state and federal laws regarding non-discrimination while providing services to children in your care. You must treat foster children in your care with dignity and respect regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, sexual orientation, and gender identity, okay? That young person that you have should not be discriminated on the basis of their gender identity. If they say that they want to be in a certain part of the facility based on their gender identity, that should be respected, okay? And I would also say too, ask them, like, are you comfortable showering with multiple, with multiple people? Should we look into a single stall option? This is not to isolate you. This is just to make sure you feel comfort. Comfort. For some young people, that would be a really lovely thing. For other young people, they'd be like, I'm comfortable in my body. Why aren't these people understanding what I'm saying, right? And so really, again, it's respecting their autonomy and getting at that piece, okay? And again, this covers group care facilities and they should be respecting this and there should be no discrimination on that basis. 
Does that answer your question, Sarah? Yes, it does. Thank you. And the positive note of this is um, because he couldn't um, be uh, placed there. Um, they finally found a LGBTQ plus uh, family, um, uh, gender non-conforming family uh, for him to move in with foster family. And um, things are going very well there. Um, he's growing in, in the pride of who he is and, and it's going really well. So I just wanted to end on a positive note, even though he wasn't allowed to. Yep. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think, I, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. And I think you you kind of alluded to a better point of like, is there a better fit than a group home for this young person, right? Is there a, what can we do to be thinking more creativity, creati creati creatively about where else to put this person besides, you know, this current situation that we're in. Um, and so I really appreciate that story and thank you so much for sharing that experience. Are there any other questions regarding this? You have, please push back on people who tell you that these young people do not have rights because they absolutely do. Okay. So this is a fairly new policy and this covers um, child welfare, um, specifically foster care. Um, and this is UCYF policy 6900. It's administrative policy. And um, the purpose is to address specific needs of LGBTQ plus children and youth and assist staff in identifying, supporting, and referring to appropriate services, okay? So children and youth will not be subject to discrimination or harassment. It's very explicit in saying that. Use gender neutral and inclusive language. So this is directed to staff and people who work with these young people, right? Allow use of chosen name and pronoun, right? So if a young person says, I use he, him pronouns, and my name is Rick, but their documentation says something else, you go off of what that young person said, right? And it's really easy just to annotate in the notes, right? As you're writing case notes. I will now be referring to insert client's legal name as Rick throughout this reporting, right? You just make that documentation. Allow expression of gender identity. So again, this refers to foster parents who have denied uh, or people who have denied young people the right to buy the clothing that aligns with their gender identity with like vouchers and whatnot. Um, that young person has the absolute right to choose what clothing they wanna wear, right? Or whatever the expression of their gender identity looks like. Um, and encourage dialogue with children and youth about disclosure of gender identity. Again, we have a whole training on what that looks like, but I think a really easy way um, to initiate that conversation is, especially if you're talking about, you know, building a relationship with that young person, is are you seeing anyone? Is there anyone who is important in your life, right? And then, you know, for gender identity, it's like, sorry, that's my dog. Um, do you feel, um, do you feel like your, your placement is affirming to you? and who you are as a person, right? Asking some of those, those questions um, kind of help allude to the, that they're like a, a door opener to the LGBTQ plus conversation, right? And if a young person doesn't wanna go there, that's fine, you match that energy. But if a young person does wanna go there, I think continuing that conversation is absolutely important. So procedure, document preferred name, uh, discuss and refer to LGBTQ plus related services if a child or youth desires. Consider LGBTQ plus identity and placement decision in making placement decisions. So what Sarah said, totally appropriate, absolutely. Placing queer youth with queer families, it's a great, wonderful thing we should be doing more. Um, and then consider or support transgender youth in seeking uh, gender affirming medical services the youth desires. Please reach out to coordinated care. This is what they do and they're very competent at this. So please, please, please reach out to coordinated care if you're not sure how to navigate medical services for the young person that you have because they, um, young person, young people, especially young people who are transitioning, they have the right to have access to hormones and they also have the right to gender affirming counseling if they wanna go through um, a physical transition, right? So please make sure that you're, that you're doing that. 
Um, and then assist youth in updating name and or gender on birth certificate. And again, in Washington, we have gender X as an option um, if a young person does not want to be M or F. Okay, that was kind of a big one. I'm gonna go ahead and pause. Are there any questions before we move on? I know I'm doing a lot of talking at you. I would love to hear if you all have any questions. Okay, home stretch. So lesson four, uh, sweat the small stuff. And I think that this gets back to one of the comments before about a little bit more about the nuance. Like this is gonna be the kind of the nuance lesson. And this specifically covers um, young people's experiences, right? Um, and this quote says, it is the small things in life which count. It is the biggest and consequential leak which empties the biggest reservoir. So again, this lesson is comprised from LGBTQ plus system alumni focus groups. Uh, there was an anonymous question that came in um, related to the last one. So are they allowed to have hormones during foster care placement? Yes. Yes. They have to obviously go through a doctor and obviously there has to be all of the steps that are associated to getting those hormones. But yes, you as an advocate should be advocating that that makes sure that that happens in their foster care placement. Um, does it have to go to the court? Um, Ryan, that's a question for you. Does it have to go through the court? I don't know, you just turned your video off. I know for me at Pierce County, if a young person wants to, I have to note it in my documentation. But Ryan, I think you have a larger systems view of that. Ask me again. I'm sorry, I was doing something um, else. So there was a question about hormones during foster care placement, and then does that have to go to the court? That was the follow-up question. Yes, it would, because yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking <clears throat> if there would be any distinction between whether or not they're legally free or not. But yeah, even then, I think it would have to go through the court. So. Mm -hmm. So what if their parents object? Yeah, that does happen. I'm not going to lie to you. This is a big point of contention in our courts and in our system right now is, is finding that place. I, I would dig in a little. I mean, I'm one of those people that is very well versed in this stuff. So if I work with families, I usually ask why they object, right? Um, just to get a better understanding of what their needs are. Some people don't understand, right? Like some, sometimes it's a fear associated thing. So resources and education is always really important. A big thing that we see is also religion, right? We want to be really careful about balancing that. And usually what I've done in the past is I bring in um, LGBTQ plus like um, affirming faith people to kind of walk through theology. But also at the end of the day, I, I don't think you can, you can make people decide things, which is why the law is very much on the LGBTQ person's side. So if a young person is over, I believe it's 13, um, some of their own medical decisions can be made by themselves without their parents, right? So really leaning into that. I think what really hurts sometimes is for young people who fall under that threshold and you just kind of have to hold that tension. In those moments, the best thing you can do is ask the young person, be real about the situation with that young person and then ask kind of how they can best be supported. Um, because the reality is, is that this is a real, this is a real tension, but our responsibility assistance providers is to be affirming of the young person. Um, and so that's the, that's what I would err on if you're in an advocating role is to acknowledge both, but also um, really emphasize um, the young person's want and needs in the moment. Um, and it's not easy. This job isn't easy, right? So I've definitely had some very defeating moments working with families and youth. Um, but I think the best thing that we can do is honor what their, um, their, their wants and needs are. Okay, are there any other questions related to some of those other things before we move forward? Also, I'm gonna kind of breeze through the ending of here because we only have about 20 minutes left and I wanna leave time for questions. So again, this um, lesson is really informed by our young people who we surveyed and listening to their voices. 
This was also informed by systems professionals, community-based service providers, and we also did a lot of law and policy reviews um, to come up with this lesson. So one of the things I just wanna say off the bat is that we're specifically focusing on LGBTQ youth today, but I think it's also really important to understand that an LGBTQ identity is not the only identity that young people hold, right? We often have, um, you know, our race plays a huge point in how we're perceived in the world and how we might go through the world. Our physical ability, right? Do we have a disability? Do we have physical limitations? You know, what is our culture like? Um, are we connected to churches? Are we connected to what kind of education access do we have? These are all things that young people bring with them in addition to an LGBTQ plus identity. And it's really important to hold space for that, right? So when we're looking at a young person, it's important to remember that they are not a monolith. They're not a monolith of who we think they are. They're actually very complex and there are multiple things that make up and affect what they need. Um, what about name change? When a young person uh, can change their name to name what they prefer, they have to go through the courts for that. But yeah, they can change their name. Okay. The experience of an LGBTQ plus individual. So when we surveyed young people and what we hear from young people all the time is that there are two kinds of experiences that they have, right? They, and we categorize them as explosions and erosions. Explosions are those big life-changing events. I got kicked out of my house, right? Um, I, um, gosh, it's escaping me, but like bigger things or like mom outed me or something consequential happened because of my LGBTQ plus identity, right? But the other thing that young people described were erosions. And so these were the smaller things, not using the right pronouns, being misgendered, not having the right name given to them, right? And what young people were describing is like, yeah, like these, these explosions are big and we put a lot of emphasis on them, but these erosions also do a lot of damage as well, right? So really remembering in this lesson that is also the small things or small interactions that can also be really harmful to our young people that we're working with. So some of the erosions that young people described were about assumptions, right? Assumptions were made about them. And this drawing says, don't assume I'm straight, don't assume I'm gay, right? We all know what assumptions make us out of and we just don't wanna go there when it comes to our young people. I think the best thing we can do is have honest dialogue with them. Uh, and then this also says, uh, simultaneously conspicuous and unrecognized. So this quote really describes it. It would be too easy to say that I feel invisible and said I feel painfully visible and entirely ignored. So these are like transgender non-binary people is like, it's pretty obvious I'm trans or it's pretty obvious that I'm like non-binary, but nobody ever wants to talk about it. And it's like, you, you, you just, you can't do that. It's obviously very important to them if they're expressing it. And so we have to, we absolutely have to meet them where they're, where they're at in that. Other erosions, young people described, it's just a phase, right? Or they will get over it. And a lot of young people got, I just don't know how to help you, right? These are not well-meaning phrases and young people feel this and then it's an issue of trust, right? And really at the end of the day, what we want is to build trust with their young people that we're working with. Other erosions. So this is a specific example that um, a young person described to us. Um, and so this person says, in detention, I was perceived as a butch lesbian. People assume that you're just like a predator, like you can't be housed with other girls because you're going to sleep with them. What do we actually know about this young person's sexual orientation? So. Anyone? Nothing, it's all perception. Thank you, exactly. We don't know anything, but the perception alone was enough to, to have them be discriminated in a way that they felt, right? So that's, that's what's, real. I mean, and even if they were a lesbian, that doesn't mean that they're, that they're automatically, I mean, I think LGBTQ plus people are always hyper, hyper sexualized. And I, again, sexual activity does not equal like sexual orientation or, or, or gender identity, right? 
um, two completely different things. And we have to really, really get away from those negative stereotypes because things like this, this is the consequence and this is them experience discrimination in these systems. Um, and so these are some of the explosions that young people describe. So um, young people being told your gender identity is a symptom of a psychological illness. Um, and we, in, in um, this next phrase, I just want to caveat and say that we actually, um, we don't, we work really closely with faith communities in this work. We can't not work closely with faith communities in this work. And we're not saying that there's any one religion that is particularly more homophobic than another, um, but this is just what young people have said. So you need to quote, pray to God and accept Jesus in response to coming out, right? And I just wanna to say too, that this can be really harmful for LGBTQ plus young people who have a faith identity, right? Like this is their community and to be rejected by their community in this way is a really hard thing to internalize. So we work really, really hard with faith um, organizations to really help affirm young people, especially if this happens, um, because we want them to feel like they can still have a faith um, and also um, have community. Because when you're going through a system, that's the like having community is the one thing that you absolutely need. So this is special considerations for bisexual, pansexual youth. Um, so biphobia is a thing in the community, right? Um, basically. Um, by folks um, get discrimination from both people inside of the LGBTQ community and also outside of the LGBTQ community. Um, bisexual, pansexual youth are often told to either be gay or straight, right? I tried coming out to my mother, but she adamantly claimed that you could only be gay or straight and there was no in between. As a bisexual, I feel shunned by the gay and lesbian community. Um, if I feel like I were to come out as bisexual, people just think I'm a slut. Um, pardon the, the harsh language, but this is the reality that our young people are operating under. Um, and so the biggest thing to understand with that, again, sexual activity does not equal sexual orientation, right? So really meeting the young person where they're at and honoring what they're saying and parroting that back to them. And then we also wanna take considerations for transgender youth. This is our most vulnerable population. And I really do think that this is where the, the, the rubber meets the road when it comes to safety right? This, this population is considerably at risk for suicidal ideation and behavior, and we really need to be on it as professionals in, in affirming them. And one study that shows this is that um, this is a study out of um, the University of Austin, and specifically, uh, it's around a use of chosen names. So transgender youth who are able to use their chosen names in multiple contexts, home, school, work with friends, reported fewer depressive symptoms and less suicidal ideation and behavior. Using chosen name in just one context resulted in 29 decrease in suicidal ideation and a 56% decrease in suicidal behavior. I cannot tell you that at the end of the day, like affirming young people for who they are actually saves lives. Like there's data that shows that. So we need to be really proactive when working with these young people and affirming who they are because we can be that one context for them, okay? It's really, really important that we are affirming these young people. We're not going to do this activity, we just don't have time, but I will send it out um, and I uh, encourage you all to practice because this is a pronoun activity. Um, I'm gonna pause real quick. Are there any questions? I know we kind of breeze through that, but I just wanna make sure we have time at the end to recap. In reports, I refer to legal name and then say prefer to other name and use it throughout the report. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, I'm also one of those people too, that if like they're in conversation, even if that young person has said like, look, I'm out, this is the name I use. And like, they're not even there in the room. I'm like making sure that I'm using that right name. Right. Because it's about making sure that we're going through the motions of honoring that, um, and really, truly valuing that. Um, but if they're not, then that's a more complicated road. Right. And I have to respect what their boundaries are. Any other questions? So something I also wanna refer you all to, we have done our, um, we've been building resource maps. And so we go through different counties that our programs are in um, and we talk to local um, 
we got really creative. We talked to community providers, but we also talked to businesses. Like, is there a local coffee shop or a park that a young person feels particularly safe in? Um, and if the answer is yes, and they meet a certain criteria, then they go on the resource map. So I will drop a link um, in my follow-up email with you all um, so that you make sure that you have that, but we have built, um, and we're the goal is to have them statewide, but we have built them in um, most of the counties that we are in at the moment. And this is just an example of what Spokane uh, County's map looks like. Are there any questions related to resources? And I just also wanna say regarding resources, if you have, uh, if you are like, I have no idea where to even look, email me, just email me. Chances are someone knows someone. Sarah, I saw yourself come off of mute. Do you have a question? Oh, never mind. I saw you had the link on the um, on the PowerPoint because this person was placed in Spokane. So <laughs> okay, great, wonderful. Other questions? Oh yeah. Okay. We're just on Zoom all day. Hi, Megan. It looks like you are off mute. Do you have a question? Oh. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. I hear you on Zoom all day. Aren't we all done? <laughs> um, okay, so lesson five, start with the fundamentals. If we can't begin to agree on the fundamentals, then we really are not ready to march forward into the future. So these are the basic principles that we say you should be on board with, right? If you're gonna serve LGBTQ plus youth. One, LGBTQ plus youth exists, meeting the specific needs of LGBTQ youth plus youth is a matter of health, safety, and well-being. The health, safety, and well-being of youth is a priority. Youth have the right to self-determination. Youth, LGBTQ youth are individuals. Youth are entitled to equitable services and resources. Understanding LGBTQ plus youth is a core competency for every professional volunteer and caregiver. Youth have expertise in their own life. Making assumptions is harmful. Collaboration is the key to success. If you are having trouble building bridges with people, this is a really good resource. And it's like, can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? Because sometimes stuff gets in the way. We forget the youth in the process. That's life, right? But I think sometimes if you have a core principle to go back to, you're able to solve the problem at hand instead of getting into an argument with the person who you're trying to get resources from for that young person. So feel free to use this. I haven't seen anyone that says health, safety, and well-being of youth is a priority. No, one's has, no one has disagreed with me on that yet. So um, please, please, please use this, right? Especially if you're talking with people who disagree about things. Fundamental rights. Um, so this is something that's in the protocol, but uh, we have, uh, youth have the right to be openly LGBTQ um, refrain from disclosing our sexual and gender identity uh, or any other identity, except non-disclosure. Sometimes they're not going to tell us and that's okay. Live free from discrimination, wear clothing consistent with our gender identity, use our chosen names, use our pronouns, use the restrooms that is consistent with our gender identity. The very basis, let's respect who people are. Okay, and then this is lesson six, the time for change is now. If you don't like the road you're walking, start paving another one. Dolly Parton, queer icon, we love her. Um, and so we're kind of nearing the end. And so I just want to wrap up with saying, I think that all of this information is really great, but at the end of the day, we need action steps, right? Like how are we going to take this information that we've internalized and what are we going to do with it? So I want to know what, so what, now what? So what, what is one observation you have from today, right? Your so what, what is, what conclusion can you draw from your what? And now what, what action will you take as a result of your so what? So take a moment in the chat. I wanna hear your reflection. I wanna hear your pause and I wanna hear what you're gonna do with the information that you've gathered today. And please, if you, if you feel comfortable, please uh, share it in the chat. This helps us um, wrap up any last questions that you all have or, any of that. So we're going to take a minute, we're going to do that, and then we'll end today's, uh, today's presentation.
and apologies, uh, looks like Nicholas did get permanently kicked off. <laughs> so we're improvising a little bit. I'm taking over some of his lessons. Tim, is that a question, the use of pronoun next to name? Is it like why we do that? Or is that something you're going to start doing? No, that's what I'll, I'm doing. And the rest of my volunteers, for sure, are going to be doing for now on, just to keep that window, just keep that open for, for kids so they know that, yeah. we're, that we're being observant. Yep. Yep. And even like having like, I mean, I know that this is kind of in your face, but like having like little things like this like in your background or just like a little like safe space sticker, like that's really helpful. That opens a lot of doors. I can't tell you how many people have been like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, of course. Jan saying I have much to learn about pronouns. Again, that uh, that website I sent, mypronouns.org. Um, it's really useful and it walks through a lot of stuff. Ooh. All of it's coming at once. Um, so simple, so basic, so overlooked. Thank you. That's, yeah, sometimes it's the little things that count, right? One of my kiddos was placed because of suicidal ideation. Now the kiddo is happy. Everything seems to be going well. Should I press or initiate in any way about how the kiddo is dealing with LGBTQ plus issues or leave that up to the therapist? I don't want to invade privacy, but I want to advocate. I think being real, I mean, just saying like, is there anything related to your identity that I can be advocating for? is like a really great opener. And then just also saying, hey, if you don't wanna talk about it with me, like I really hope that you are getting that need in, in therapy. Um, the last thing you wanna do is pathologize what they're going through, right? Really keeping it strength-based is gonna be really important when you have that conversation. Um, just don't say LGBTQ plus issues because people are gonna be like, you have an issue with me being LGBTQ. Um, approaching it as like, what can I do for you is like always so great, a great way to, um, open that door. Miss the safe space sticker. Thank you, Leslie. You're absolutely welcome. Listening to words of Hindu to describe themselves and using and parroting back. Mm -hmm. Yep. Super intentional, which I, because, yep, making sure. I have space for individuals and trying to make comfortable place for people to share. Absolutely. So with these final moments, I just want to open up any last question, any burning thoughts. Um, I'm always available via here. Let me give you my contact info. But I'm this Morgan's my boss, but um, you can always contact me as well. Um, any any last burning questions that you have? I know that we that there were a lot of questions about pronouns and apologies, we didn't get to that. That's a very important thing. And we need to be better about time restraints and making sure that we incorporate that. I wanna own that. Um, but the resource I left you really does walk through that very thoroughly. So I really encourage you to take your um, time with mypronouns.org um, and think about that. It's also really good for like employee to employee interactions too, not just with young people, but like how do I show up for like my coworker? Uh, yes, my contact info will be included in the slides when you get them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Thank you for your time. Thank you all for your time. I think that it's important to show up and you all did it. I think that that's really great. And that really gives me a lot of encouragement that you all are here for LGBTQ plus youth. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you, thank you. Well, if there aren't any questions, you all are free to have uh, three minutes back to your of your life. And I hope um, the rest of your Zoom meetings go well and no one loses power because of the storm. So have a wonderful day, everybody.